Hey adventurers, this is Mike Putman welcoming you back to No Tourist Allowed, your go-to podcast for all great things travel. And I'm James Ferrara. We wanted to remind you about our amazing seven-night Virgin Voyages cruise giveaway that is still up for grabs. One lucky winner will get the luxury of a sea terrace cabin with the freedom to choose your ship and sailing date. And entering is super easy, guys. You can join our newsletter, tell us your favorite travel destination and airline, visit our YouTube channel, or even just refer a friend to the podcast. Check the details in our show notes for the link to enter or visit our website directly at notouristallowed.com. Now, let's get started with today's episode. Welcome to No Tourists Allowed, a podcast where two recognized travel industry executives with a combined 71 years on the inside of travel and technology give up their secrets to the thing everyone wants to do. Travel better, spend less, and see more of the world. Here are your hosts, Mike Putman and James Ferrara. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Putman. And I am James Ferrara. And Mike, you have the 70 years and I have one. Right, that's not the way. I was just, I actually as as our producer Nathaniel was going through that, I was calculating in my head. I think I think that number might be a little bit low. Um, <laughs> all right, it's all well, it's all where we will admit to, though, right? Yeah. Uh, well, welcome everybody. Welcome to No Tourists Allowed, and you know this is the podcast where we try to help you travel better, travel in a more authentic way, um, a more memorable way and maybe steer clear of some of the more typical touristy things to do. So we try to pepper in some very specific tips. Um, Mike and I have been known to enjoy a meal now and then. So we often have restaurant recommendations for you, hotel recommendations for you, um, uh, experience recommendations for you. And uh, we've been sharing our manifesto with you this season, uh, about a dozen points, uh, our advice, certainly our view on uh, the kind of travel we'd like to see you enjoy. Right, Mike? Yeah, just to open up your eyes and see things a little bit differently. Um, and, and I think if you experience travel in a real authentic, what uh, my kids call a non-touristy way, uh, it, it, you, it, you expose yourself to, new, to more and more new cultures. Um, and it really can open your eyes and it can change your perspective on life. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that is a real part, a big part of my why, why I'm still doing this is that um, the, the change that you can see through people who haven't had the, uh, the opportunity to travel, um, you know, in, in a real way, let's just call it a real way. And when you see those people come back or you, you actually see them in the middle of their travel and they're, they're seeing these new cultures, new foods, new, new things, and their mind just opens up and it less, it becomes less about them. You know, oftentimes when we're pushing things away, we call other people them and more about us. And, um, that's what drives me. That's a big, big part of my driver to stay in this wacky business. Um, but we do have a senior person uh, with us today who's part of this wacky business. Uh, and that wacky business is uh, Norwegian Cruise Lines, one of the premier cruise lines. And we're so happy to have the senior vice president of sales, John Jerneski, on. Good day, John. How are you? I'm doing great, Mike. Thank you and James for having me. Oh, great to see you. Um, great to see you, John. And you, you've got, we're going to get into it with you because. You've got what? It must be twenty-five years in the cruise industry. You're very kind. Uh, I'm older <laughs> than that. It's uh, I think I'm going into year thirty-two, right out of kindergarten, really? and um, <laughs> here I am. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's great. So we're going to try to make use of that. But we want to start out by helping our listeners get to know you uh, a little bit. We have a little tradition here of Mike asking some rapid fire questions kind of putting you in the hot seat about your personal travel style love it exactly so just 
the first thing that comes to your mind, John, um, and we've got five or six of these questions, so um, just a short answer is fine. Um, but one we normally start with is what is your favorite hotel brand or individual property and, and why that might be? Oh, it's a property that no longer exists. Uh, it's It was on the island of Morea, Um and it was... a. Now I'm forgetting the name of it. Oh my God. It would, um, there was an intercontinental there. It was the intercontinental. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, we did a few nights there be- and closed right before the pandemic or maybe during the pandemic. Um, just a wonderful overwater bungalow experience with my family. You can't, can't go wrong, but having just stayed at the Ritz Carlton in Kapalua on Maui, uh, I guess I'm pretty spoiled. Love that experience. Yeah. Those are uh, great examples. Yeah, Maria is a beautiful place. Um, and for our listeners, um, a lot of people say I'm going to, I want to go to Tahiti. Well, Tahiti is a place in the French Polynesians, right? So uh, it's it's kind of similar like saying I want to go to Hawaii, but you go to Maui, Hawaii. Not exactly the same, but and Maria is an island very close to Tahiti um, with a lot less commercialism. It's just a gorgeous place and um one of one of those um islands that have the over the water bungalows which is a really really cool experience yeah so john what's your favorite destination um and and when you're thinking about that is there a a restaurant or two or an activity that makes this favorite makes this your favorite destination well, I feel very spoiled that I've been able to travel, and it's hard. It's like picking your favorite child when you say, "What's your favorite destination?" Honestly, for me, although I have twin boys and I have a dog named Murphy, and Murphy, I typically say is my favorite son because he's much nicer. <laughs> but I will say, I'll get a little sentimental. Um, my mom passed about five years ago, and one of the trips we did with her before she died was going to Alaska. And I've I've been very fortunate through my career to spend a lot of time in Alaska, both on work trips and on pleasure trips. And so I got, I, Alaska is a broad destination. If I won the lottery, I'd, I'd own a home in Alaska that it's that meaningful yeah. to me. And, uh, so I'm, whether you're in Glacier Bay or just in the town of Juneau or Ketchikan, wherever you are, I just, I love it there. There's something about it. Uh, in terms of restaurants, um, that's a great question. If you've got some cash and you like crab, which I do Dungeons crab in particular, or King crab, uh, the Tracy's crab shack in Juneau, it's this little hut, right? It's not even a proper building. Um, he's probably, you could easily spend a thousand dollars on crap <laughs> just for lunch, which is really? nuts, but, uh, it's pretty wow. special. No, I'm going to have to look that up. I mean, Alaska is, you know, it's beautiful, physically beautiful, right? The nature is incredible there, but also there's a kind of frontier spirit mm-hmm. there. It is a bit hard to define, but I, I agree with you. Really compelling. There's an interesting his- history on uh, Skagway, if you want to go look that up. That was mm-hmm. known as the place where anybody that was either tried to escape something, whether it was an ex-wife or husband or the law, <laughs> somehow ended up in Skagway. So that's got that rough mentality there, which is uh, is quite fun. I'll make a note of that. <laughs> Skagway. <laughs> for, for a future destination. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, John, what's the, what is the coolest uh, shore excursion you've ever been on? Well, it wasn't a sh- – you're talking shore excursion off a cruise or just like a day trip that I've done? Either one. Either – Anything? Well, I would say a combination of I'll, – I'll give you two answers. One is a, a true shore excursion up in Alaska, helicopter trip out to – the Mendenhall Glacier, and then we were basically alpine mountaineering for a couple hours with the helmets and the ice axes and the crampons on our feet, and it was fantastic. Uh, and that we did not that long ago with my family. Before we had kids, back when we had a lot of fun, we would go scuba diving a lot, and I've been to the Galapagos Islands, and so to be scuba diving there uh, and seeing everything there is on steroids. Everything is bigger, whether it's a sea lion or a penguin or a seahorse uh the whales whale sharks in particular sharks um yeah that was magical i I just wanted something years ago i did that and i still remember it 
Well, it sounds great except for the sharks. Oh, they're fantastic. They're mostly harmless, James. Just don't poke <laughs> it's them. The mostly part. Yeah, that when you're worries. when you're when you're in the water and you got like a nine foot Galapagos shark, and it's a called a Galapagos shark because it's endemic to that region. It doesn't not find anywhere else in the world. Um, you tend to give it its birth, but it's really not looking out for you. It's looking out for other things. So, yeah, interesting. You know what's funny, James? Is a few weeks ago we had another guest on, and we asked the excursion question, and they said the same thing about that um, trekking in Alaska. Um, exact same yeah. thing. So I did a helicopter to Mendenhall, and I had like a crazy ex-Vietnam helicopter pilot and we were doing like stunts and barely made it back to the ship <laughs> so it was memorable too but for a different reason <laughs> i remember doing a helicopter trip in alaska years ago where it was it was called the pilot's choice and the pilot would land on two different spots out on the ice fields or on the glacier it was up to him to decide that day or her and the pilot landed and we were in this crevasse and on this glacier coming down and i said to the pilot we're walking around and drinking the glacier melt water and I said, are there any animals around here? Do you get bears around? He's like, oh, no. He said, look around here. There's nothing to eat. It's all just bear and rock and, and the ice. And so, okay. So we get in the helicopter. We're taking off. And as we're taking off, a bear runs right in front of this is a, this is a grizzly bear, right in front of our helicopter. And I said, didn't you just say there's no, we would have been eaten if we had left two minutes later. Yeah. The fun of travels. No, close to nature. A little too close. So, John, uh, when you travel for business or personally, do you uh, are you an aisle or a window guy? Well, I'm a window guy because I don't want to be disturbed, but I also have the bladder of a hamster. <laughs> and so I have to really schedule my liquid intake. And I'm also a considerate traveler, so I don't try to bother the person next to me. If I do have to get up, I wait for them. And hopefully they do get up because if not, I have to climb over them or ask them to move. I think you might be our first window person that we've had on, but uh, good for you. Yeah. And one last thing, do you carry on or do you check your luggage typically? I do everything in my power to carry on. I have a trip coming up that's going to take me 10 days on three different sections, two of two different cruises, one land thing, and I've got multiple outfits, and I am strategizing how I can avoid checking that back because I'll never see it again. Right on, John. You're in my camp, clearly in my camp on that one. You know, I used to say, I, I mean, obviously the three of us travel, you know, professionally. I travel every week. And I used to say I've never lost my luggage. Uh, and then on a recent trip this year, my luggage went astray in one of these airport meltdown weekends. And uh, it showed up on my doorstep a week later with no communication from the airline or anything. I just have to open my front door and my suitcase had found its way home. Amazing. John, let's talk a little bit about uh, your company. So um, NCL, uh, for a lot of our, a lot of our listeners may not know about NCL. What's, what's your brand promise at NCL? What are you about? Yeah. Our brand promise is really about giving you the freedom to choose what you want to do, when you want to do it. Uh, we used to be a cruise line that only went to kind of, I would call it uh, fun in the sun environments and shorter cruising. And we now go 421 ports around the world, 118 countries, 19 ships. Uh, Europe, Alaska, Caribbean are our biggest. We've got a year round ship in Hawaii. We go to Asia, Australia, the exotics. So we kind of cater to a very wide audience when it comes to the destination. Um, we are a contemporary cruise line, but we go to what I call premium destinations, the places I just mentioned, which people book, you know, a year or more out because they want to plan their next summer. And they're doing that right now pretty heavily. Um, we also have, I would say, a great multi-generational travel opportunity because we have what's called the Haven on our ships, which is a sweet experience. And it's a ship within a ship, meaning you have a key card to get into that space. You've got your suite, you've got your concierge, you've got your private butler private dining, bars, observation lounge, all for you. You never want to leave it. Uh, James is nodding along. Uh, I know he loves that kind of special attention, as he should. Uh, who doesn't? So imagine you have the grandparents who have the money. They want to take care of themselves, and the rest of the family stays in a nice balcony cabin. You've got water slides, racetracks for the kids, good shows, good food, 
we truly try to appeal, give something for everybody. Uh, but those grandparents at the end of the day can escape from the rest of the family and just lock themselves away in the Haven, which I recommend. Yeah, I'm a Haven guy. I mean, you've got your own restaurant on most of the ships. You've got concierge assistants, got a bar in there. Um, it's, it's quieter. It's private. The, the fitting out of the cabins is more luxurious uh, and the rest of the ship is beautiful also, but there's just something really special about the Haven. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big fan, John. Uh, so our listeners, uh, who are watching us on our YouTube channel, will see behind you a big sign and, uh, that says Viva and, uh, tell us a little bit about that what's going on well it's our brand new ship our 19th ship in our fleet james you and i are going to be there next week for the inauguration uh very excited she's the second ship in that class uh the first ship was the prima uh it's a really a wonderful design ship really bringing the outdoors and and captivating um you know people into that experience of let's dine out the, outside let's enjoy that experience when you're at sea there's nothing quite like it and to take advantage of that Plus, the interiors are gorgeous and um, more. A billion restaurants. On, yeah. On Especially board. restaurants are fantastic. <clears throat> um, and the sign says Beetlejuice. Yeah. Don't say that three times. But yes, we are <laughs> doing a uh, the Broadway show Beetlejuice. For those that don't know, Beetlejuice went to Broadway. Uh, we all know the movie and the show is fantastic. And we're actually premiering uh, that show next week for us, James. It's been out for a little while now. And the cast uh, and crew are doing an amazing job delivering that. Looking forward to seeing that. And if we have listeners who haven't been on a big ship cruise in the last number of years, I mean, when you say you're doing the Broadway show Beetlejuice, it's not some like a uh, skinny down version. These are full productions with full sets. And I mean, it's really like you're on Broadway and, um, it's incredibly fun. It's one of my favorite things to do on a cruise ship. And I know that isn't particularly about uh, no tours allowed or sense of place or anything, but it's just incredibly fun and enjoyable. And I love to do it. And usually if there's a couple of performances um, on the cruise, I, I go to more than one, you know? Yeah. That's a great point you raised about it. It's not just a traveling road show where they're going to do, you know, one tenth of what you're going to see on Broadway. It is a licensed product where the owners of the producers of that show want to maintain that integrity and so everything about it the costumes the staging the lighting the the talent yeah. that has to go through all the rehearsals yeah it's a full-fledged production and and it's for free so yeah. you pay a lot of money to go see these things on broadway and to have that experience like you say why why not see it more than once it's it's really a special experience but bringing this back around to our ethos here at no tourist salon um how do you get a real sense of place if you're traveling on a cruise? Yeah, so you imagine you're on a ship and you've got, let's say, 3,000 people. And you think, oh my God, 3,000 people. You know, that's a lot of people. Well, keep in mind, these ships are very large and there is a tremendous amount of space. The way these ships are designed is to create multiple venues with smaller capacity. So you don't, you never feel like you're on a ship with 3,000 people. That's the ultimate goal uh, for when our team is designing these ships. You want to feel, if ultimately it's about connecting, right, with the people that you travel with or making new friends um, on a cruise. And that is the beauty of a trip that you're going to run into random people that may have that same affinity for the same bourbon at a bar at night or going on that short excursion together and you start and create could, could be lifelong friendships uh, or you're just there to connect with your family and you find those intimate spaces um you you tend to kind of find your own path and you get into your routine with your the people you're traveling with and um i have been on many many cruises and i've never felt wow there's so many people here i just feel like the service is great and i feel catered to i'm always sort of struck actually in the elevators open and there's nobody in them you know and you think three thousand people four thousand people are going to be crammed in with people but actually you're right because of the design 
of the ship and just how much space there is. Yeah. It doesn't feel that way at all. Um, but uh, let's say we're on a cruise and the ports of call are interesting islands or places we haven't been before. There's an opportunity to, I mean, the ship itself is a destination, right? So there's that. But there's an opportunity to get a good sense of other destinations, the ports of call you visit through what? I guess the excursion programs on board? Yeah. Yeah. And so I think uh, let's take Europe as an example. I, I recommend people who have not been to Europe before go on a cruise. Obviously, a Norwegian cruise would be preferred. Um, and I say that because you have a chance in a short window of time to visit multiple countries with multiple ports and feel like you, I would almost say it's, it can be overwhelming because we at Norwegian spend so much time in port. There are many cruises where there's no days at sea. It's port after port after port because we want you to experience as much of that destination as possible. That can be exhausting. So bring your comfortable shoes and I highly recommend you take a post-trip sabbatical a couple days maybe in that city before you fly out so you can relax and obviously you get to experience that city um but the short excursion program you talk about is an amazing way to feel like that you've seen if you have a limited window of time let's say you got 12 hours in port that i recommend to people the last thing i want to see people do is pull into that port and say honey what are we going to do today i think you've then missed out on the chance to maximize your time and experience whether you want to do a museum tour in the morning or whether you want to walk around the city or whether you want to go on you know, whatever it is in the afternoon that you really are packing as much in, or just you want to go to a local restaurant. You don't have to do an organized short excursion. That's totally up to you. You can get into the city. You know, if you're in Barcelona, as an example, you can just walk the Rambla and just go from tapas to tapas and maybe hit the, you know, Picasso Museum, whatever it might be. There's so many options. I have to admit, sometimes I, I do feel like that. Like I'm not going to get on and organize. I'm just going to go get lost yeah. on my own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that really, um, rings true when people ask me about going to Hawaii that, uh, and from the East coast, you know, it's not a destination that people go to every year, like they might from the West coast, just because of the distance. But if, if people are, if it's going to be a once in a lifetime trip, I say, take a cruise because you're going to get so much benefit from being on a ship, unpacking one time. Yeah. Um, but being, being able to, uh, travel at night and, um, and see lots of, lots of different ports. Yeah. Um, or even overnights. You've got on our Hawaii trip. It's a seven day trip. There's no days at sea. You've got overnights in Maui and in Kauai. I love so those. You can really get a sense of the destination, having that meal ashore. If you want to do it, go to a luau, um, stay out a right little bit. bit. Yeah. Get, not, get not feel trouble. pressured. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> I've been to Hawaii many, many times, and uh, and I went and on in trouble Spain. many times. Too. Yeah, well, we'll <laughs> think that for another time. But, um, but doing the cruise and doing the NCL cruise was without a doubt, hands down, the best way to do it. And and are you guys still the only ones that are able to do that? We are. We're the only uh, company that has a um, the way the ship is flagged, which means we have a certain percentage of our crew are um, Americans on board, which is not usually the case uh, based on foreign flag vessels. We have to, we don't have to call it a foreign port. And so we have a very um, easy way of experiencing all the major islands in one week, whereas other cruise lines have to sail quite a bit across the ocean to come um, from the mainland to do it. And just for our listeners, John, can you kind of explain a little bit more that that, that rule that would uh, give you the ability to do it and not a foreign flagged carrier? Yeah, it's a, um, a very old law um, that basically they call the Jones Act, which means that if a foreign flag vessel is calling on uh, American ports, you have to also have a foreign port as part of that trip. So whether, like, let's say you're doing uh, Hawaii and you had to sail out of Los Angeles, you would have to stop back in Mexico on the way or on the way back or on the way there to qualify uh, for that rule. You see it a lot in Alaska. If you sail out of Seattle, um, you can't just go from Seattle and only do Alaska ports. You typically see a call in Victoria, part of British Columbia, which last I checked is in Canada. Beautiful island, by the way. Uh, beautiful spot, the Bucard Gardens. I'm not a garden guy, but if you're in Victoria, go to the gardens. I tell you what, it is fantastic. Yep. 
Um, so I, I don't want to leave out that cr cruise lines also uh, bring the the sense of place on board, right? So if you're cruising in a particular part of the world um, through what menus, through onboard entertainment, maybe even lectures, right? Yeah, all the above. I mean, your weather, and depending on the length of the voyage and how many days are at sea, um, we try to infuse as much as we can from a culinary standpoint, drinks, um, which I'm a big fan of, having those folkloric shows um, you know, when we're, we're talking Hawaii and having, um, you know, people come on and do the folkloric shows is always a big hit, but those speakers, you know, the, they could be an expert in that region there to talk about whatever the subject might be. Yeah. You know, we're really trying to bring as much of the destination onto the ship. Mike, when you sailed Hawaii, did you feel like you were in Hawaii throughout your trip on the ship or did you? I did. I did. Yes, absolutely. And they brought on dance, or not just dancers, but they brought on local performers at every point. And you got laid, right? Uh, several times, several times. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's um, move on to something a little more serious uh, because I, I think this is top of mind. I see this anyway with our customers at Intel Travel. Um, we, we now are past the pandemic, which was the conversation for several years, right? And thankfully it's not anymore. But the new conversation seems to be about uh, environmental responsibility mm -hmm. and taking care of this world that we are traveling around and seeing, or in our case, the three of us, the world that we're out there selling, actually. So some people have criticized cruise lines for being environmentally, um, uh, not environmentally responsible. What do you say to that, John, as a knowledgeable 30 something year veteran of the cruise industry. Well, it's interesting when I look back on my career, as you say, and, and from early nineties, when I started to now and how our industry has, um, really shifted in such a positive way, everything from, um, reusable plastics and the recycling efforts on board and, and re eliminating reusable uh, like single use, I should say, plastics, right. uh, eliminating single use plastics, uh, the types of fuel that's being used and, and, the, and the, how technology uh, and innovation and technology will, I think, be constantly integrated into the cruise ships moving forward. And you see every cruise line now has, because uh, we're all in this together. This isn't something where I, I personally want to stand up on a stage and say, we're the most involved. Like nobody wins in that regard. We really are all aligned on this, and every every yeah. line, every cruise line is is um, doing the best we can to minimize our carbon footprint, um, minimize the waste that takes place on board, uh, and uh, the energy consumption, the fuel consumption through technology, LED lighting, all the little little things add up to big things. Yeah. Um, Even and, the way the the hull is painted, yeah. Sometimes, right? All of these things. Yeah, the fuel efficiency and and uh, the yeah, absolutely. It's uh, it's it's a very important part of our focus, and we've got a dedicated team that does nothing but that. Uh, well, and it, yeah, it's important. I want more travelers to be aware of it, and um, even beyond that, cruise lines. I know this is true of Norwegian also. Donate to oceanographic conservation organizations, yep. and and. Just do a lot, spend millions and millions of dollars to protect the oceans and to um, and to limit. And now, you know, what's been happening lately is some even destination stewardship, we call it. So there are cruise lines that are not pulling into certain ports that are more fragile than others and using alternate uh, embarkation places, right? So I just... I'm not sure our listeners are aware of all that. And if you are interested, if this is of concern to you, be an educated traveler and consumer. Go to the website of the cruise line you're considering traveling with or the vacation partner or whomever, and you'll find lots of information about this if you seek it out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's go to some... Uh, personal stuff. And, and I don't know, did you, 
have a guest with you, a special guest with you for this podcast. So those is audio. I'm showing a bobblehead of myself, which kind of looks like Joe Pesci and John Travolta had a baby. Doesn't look anything <laughs> like me, which is why it's funny. Uh, yeah, I'm known for having this stupid bobblehead and uh, love him dearly. He's got a bit of an attitude, so I don't really want to have him featured too much. Okay. Well, uh, whether it's you or bobblehead who answers, um, we want to get some tips from you mm. for our listeners to travel in this more authentic and more memorable way um so is there anything special you do when you go to a new destination or a favorite destination maybe when you arrive at the hotel anything that you know increases your enjoyment or helps you get to know a place better i tend to i'm a researcher and i like to plan in advance when i go on trips not everybody's like that some people just spur the moment you want to take it uh as it comes and that's fine i've done it i've done it both ways um and, and i remember just a random thought when i was on my honeymoon we were in australia and we had one night in sydney we had done most of our time scuba diving in and these beautiful resorts up in the um, um, northeast in the cans area and we had one night in sydney and we hadn't had any plans we knew we were here for dinner talked to the it was a guy who was bringing our bags to the room and i said so this, the answer is talk to somebody who lives there, right? Get some input. And yeah. I said, where should we go for dinner? And he said, there's a great Thai restaurant down on the key, overlooks the opera house. There's a balcony. And we're like, okay. So we just wander down there, got lucky with a wonderful seat and overlooking the opera house for dinner on our last night in Australia. Um, so talking to people locally about what do you recommend? And I, I get the Yelps of the world are meant to represent the <laughs> aggregation of all those <laughs> comments. But there's just something about talking to the concierge at your hotel or the, the valet or the bellhop who's lived there. What do you recommend? Uh, and and ask the question to say, where do you recommend that isn't as popular for tourists but is more for locals? Because what the first sign of success of a restaurant is when I walk in and let's say I'm in Japan and all I see are Japanese people. That's sure. what I want to see. If I walk in and see a bunch of American tourists I tend to feel like it's not as authentic, which is exactly what this whole podcast is about, right? Is That's getting right. the flavor of that local uh, culture. And it, it could be a hole in the wall place. Those are often the best places. But getting that advice of, of, of from a local, I would recommend. Great advice. Yes. We're, Great advice. Yeah, we're with you on that. John, just one last question. Is there anything you do, any tricks or hacks that you do when you take a flight that you could share with the audience? Anything you pack special or? Uh, I I actually have a little travel pouch that I bring with me that James came from the Japan, the Japanese Tourism uh, Association that we got on our trip to Japan several years yep. ago. And in there I have my eye mask, my earbuds, um, all my chargers, all that kind of stuff. So depending on the flight, if it's an overnight flight, like a red eye flight, I tend to go into the flight I have made sure I've gone to the bathroom. I have not drank any water. I have fed myself. I am not reliant upon anything, but I am going to go to sleep to maximize my time of sleeping while I'm on that nighttime flight. If it's a daytime flight, I'm enjoying the heck out of it. Uh, and I'm, you know, going to load up my iPad with some movies. Uh, actually, if my boss is listening, I'm on my laptop working usually. <laughs> um, jet lag is the, is the issue. And my tip for jet lag, is when you get there, I'll tell you a story. I went to Italy to get on a ship and outside of Rome in the little town of Civitavecchia. I'd never been to Rome before, and so I stayed at a hotel right in the city center there. And I landed, and I was at the hotel at 12 noon. I had about an hour and a half of sleep. It wasn't the lie flat beds back in the day on Alitalia. It was a horrible night uh, of, of travel. I'm absolutely exhausted. I knew if I went to bed, I would sleep until 10 p.m., and then I was screwed. So I just got my stuff, I was by myself, and I walked Rome until 9 p.m. Having lunch, having coffee, having dinner, going to the museums. I was so tired. I was a walking zombie. But when my head hit the pillow that night, I slept for eight hours sound, and I immediately forced that, uh, you know, acclimatization or whatever the word is of getting used to that time zone. That's my tip is don't go take a nap. Very good. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you there. I'm actually suffering. We 
Mike and I were in Spain together last week, and for some reason, I I think when you get older too, it changes. It's a bit harder to to get your body back in shape, and uh, Mike is suffering from some kind of bug he picked up. I'm suffering from just messed up sleep and jet lag. Yeah. Years ago, I used to follow the Jet Lag Diet, which was a book that came out in the 80s and supposedly used by American presidents and diplomats for how to manipulate light and carb intake in the days prior to your trip to get your body ready for that shift. Okay. Particularly at that time, I was traveling to Asia like a 12-hour time shift, which is really brutal, you know? Yeah. Anyway, I don't use that diet anymore. I basically eat carbs 24-7, and it's not working. <laughs> My tip is I have a little travel sound machine. It's much better than what you're, oh. the app on your iPhone, and it's it's like 30 bucks on Amazon, and this thing emits a white noise sound. So when, when you do get to go to sleep in that foreign place, that, that strange bed, Make sure that sound and light, which is why I wear an eye mask, those will mess with you more than anything. So that is my hot tip. All right. Well, that's good stuff. A lot of good tips. It's great to have you here. Thank um, you. I am, uh, it's good to see Bobblehead again, also, I'll say. And uh, look forward to seeing you next week on the beautiful new Viva, getting to see it uh, firsthand and getting to spend time with uh, my my friends at Norwegian Cruise Lines. Thanks again, John. Thank you, James. Thank you, Mike. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. Well, James, it was great to hear from John. What a what a good guy, great guy to have in the business, and uh, we we're lucky to have him on the podcast. Yeah, the uh, bobblehead was a little tame in this appearance. You never know where that's going to go with John. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed talking to him, and he is an extremely knowledgeable guy, one of the most uh, in the cruise business. So it was a pleasure to have him here. Um, and Mike, we should take a minute and uh, just remind, speaking of cruise, remind everyone that we're doing this incredible cruise giveaway, Virgin Voyages Cruise for Two. Uh, and all of our listening, all our listeners need to do is go to our uh, website, which is oddly titled notouristallowed.com. And uh, there you'll find the ways that you can get entries into the drawing for this free cruise by telling your friends about our podcast, by signing up for our newsletter, and so on. And then uh, in a few weeks, we'll, just before the holidays, we'll be drawing for a free cruise for two people on Virgin Voyages, which is like, you know, really special. Yeah. And one of my friends just came back from a Virgin Voyage last week and he said he had the time of his life. Um, but there's only nine days, nine days left to enter. And if you do go to the website, notouristallowed.com and scroll down on the homepage, you'll see when a seven night dream voyage with Virgin Voyages cruise. And if you'll click into that, there are several ways that you can enter and do some things that will help increase your chances of winning this fabulous cruise. Uh, we've had a, a tremendous, uh, amount of people that are really getting excited about this and we're, we're happy to give it away, and somebody will get a uh, early Christmas present from No Tours to Allow. Absolutely. So um, we're at holiday time already, right? So happy Thanksgiving, we should say, to everyone, and happy Thanksgiving yes. to you, Mike. And um, we're very thankful for you, our listeners, and we're very thankful for the opportunity to travel the world for all the reasons, the values that Mike shared at the beginning of the podcast, and especially at this time when there is trouble in the world, although when is there not trouble in the world, right? But but we have some conflicts and, and wars, frankly, in the world. And that always reminds me that travel is the solution, right? Travel is the antidote to the ills of the world. Because travel, as Mike pointed out, helps us to understand each other and value each other. We learn about other cultures. We learn about people who live and think differently. 
we develop empathy and compassion, we grow as people, and and that's the true value of, of travel. And we really need travel in the world right now. Uh, so I'm very thankful for that. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Um, and Mark Twain has a great quote that's been part of my uh, email signature for quite a while. And he says, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness, um, which uh, that, Love that. that is so true. So true. But we do have a very big week ahead of us in travel. Um, you know, for, for us who distribute travel, um, we're not necessarily as busy this week selling travel because we've already sold the travel, generally speaking. And we're eating. Yeah, it's gonna. We're busy eating, right? Yeah, but we do have we do have some additional customer service demands, making sure everybody gets you know their flights are okay and their hotel accommodations are right, and and so we we tend to have a peak in our customer service departments, um, in, in dealing with some you know some people want to change their flights or whatever because there are a lot of people traveling, and we know this year, um, they're the, the U.S. government has just come out with some really interesting facts about how um, the travel economy has really come back. And um, and our Secretary of Transportation uh, came out with some stats. James, you want to share those with our listeners? Sure. Well, we just the uh, um, TSA, who runs the security in airports, keeps account of people, basically. And uh, in the last well, in the first 20 days of November, I think about 14 of those days had more people than the same days in 2019. So when people wonder, has travel come back? It's more than come back, right? We're way ahead of passenger counts from prior to the pandemic. And uh, we've seen the results of that in the past year or two uh, has, have been uh, real problems at airports during peak times and uh, problems with airlines and technology and so on. So uh, Secretary Buttigieg's press conference yesterday was about some of the things the government has done to help airlines and the airline system strengthen over the past year. So we don't have that kind of fragility in the system that led to those Armageddon weekends. Um, so it, it's good news. The test of it is right now, right? Uh, so at the time you're listening to this podcast, we've just passed Thanksgiving. The day before, the couple of days before Thanksgiving, our peak travel days of the year, the days coming up uh, just after Thanksgiving, same thing, the, the Sunday and Monday, after Thanksgiving or peak travel days, and uh, keep your fingers crossed. And we're hoping that we don't see the kind of stress and um, and and difficulty in the system that we saw at other peak times earlier in the year. Yeah, and Sunday will be the the most traveled day of the year. It always is the Sunday following Thanksgiving. So if you're traveling, even on Saturday or Sunday, um, and I'm not one to say go to the airport early, but in this case, I would go to the airport early. Uh, give yourself a little bit of extra time to get through TSA um, because there will be, you know, all, all the planes will be flying that can fly as the airlines try to garner as much revenue as possible. So um, the the airports are going to be maxed out. So get there a little bit early, get through security you know, with time to spare so you can go, you know, have a cup of coffee or have a drink or something and relax so you're not stressed out getting through that. Yeah, try to carry on. Mike will always tell you that. Oh, try yeah. Carry on rather than check your luggage. And uh, if you haven't joined either TSA PreCheck or, you know, my favorite, which is Clear, um, you can do it. You can do it right at the airport. You can join Clear. It takes five minutes. You walk over to the Clear people and they'll take care of you. And, and you cut the line, basically. You skip the whole security line. So I think uh, now is a good time of year to say, to be thankful that you joined Clear, you know? Or if you're traveling internationally, um, global entry 
is the program you want to join. Have both of them if you're traveling a lot. And boy, it'll take a lot of time uh, out of your uh, difficulties at the airport. And the other thing that I've been doing more of lately than I ever did before is using a car service to go to the airport because then I, I don't have to deal with the parking or, um, you know, dragging my luggage around, getting from the parking to the airport. At the new, uh, where I live in New York, at the new Terminal A at Newark, which is a beautiful terminal that services mostly, mostly United, um, I checked. The parking garage is a quarter of a mile from the front of the uh, wow. terminal. So it, it's really long. Uh, a car service drops you off right at curbside. And for me, that does save time and stress and, and my shoulder. <laughs> yeah, well, especially when you're lugging three or four bags in. Um, like just, I am. The one thing about clear and TSA is if you have clear and you don't have TSA, you still have to go through the T. Do you still have to go through the normal lines, which means you have to take your shoes off and put your feet on those grubby little spots that everybody else puts their disgusting feet on. And if you can imagine, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people putting their feet on those same spots, it doesn't sound real appealing. But I will tell you one tip if you have to do that, and that is to wear two pairs of socks. And you so you wear two pairs of socks. Take your shoes off, and then you you stand in the security thing, hold your hand up, and then when you get done, as you're getting ready to put your your shoes back on, you take the grubby socks off and uh, stick those in your bag. Throw them away. I think that's a great tip, Mike. But what troubles me more is I see a lot of people who go through those security lines. They take their shoes off. They have no socks on, and they walk barefoot through that. See, who are those people? What are you doing? Stop. It's disgusting, and you're going to get a terrible disease. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. Um, anyway, so some holiday travel tips. If you're bringing gifts, by the way, do not wrap them if, uh, going through security because they will make you unwrap them sometimes in, uh, in order to check them. So don't wrap your gifts. They don't like that. And um, uh, we have lots of other holiday travels. You can Google them. There's lots of lists out there. Uh, on my company website, we have holiday travel tips, some good good ideas to get you uh, through without any trouble and kind of speed your way through the airport. But in any case, we hope you get to family, friends, or whatever you're doing for fun for the holidays without any trouble at all. We hope you use this week to travel around uh, a little bit or the coming weeks in the coming holidays in December. It's a great time to travel. There are great things to do. You could be on a, a, Mike did this, you could be on a river cruise in Europe visiting the Christmas markets in Austria and Germany. This is the land of Christmas. This is where Christmas comes from. That's right. right. Chris Kringle. And, yep. Yeah. Uh, or doing any number of other things for the holidays. Um, get out there and celebrate with travel. But I will say this, if you're interested in going somewhere over the Christmas break, you need to book now because space is really, really tight um, oh, this year. You're late already. Yeah, you're definitely late. But there are some things to be found. Um, and uh, But I would People not... People like to do cruises. They like to do cruises um, even over New Year's, you know, and celebrate oh, yeah. New Year's Eve on oh, the cruise. A, yeah, it's a great so way to do it. Talk to a professional travel advisor they'll have tons of great ideas for you and take good care of you yep and uh this week being thanksgiving for those listeners in the u.s you know take some time to give thanks for all the good things that we've got you know we've got a lot of freedoms we have um um you know a great country to live in uh that despite what others say do good around the world for the most part and um something to be proud of but uh, give thanks for your health and your family and um, enjoy your star. Count your blessings. I will be on the new Norwegian Viva for the inaugural and the christening next week in Miami. And then we're doing a short sailing. Uh, Mike and I will be in Orlando and then Cancun for some industry events. Looking forward to that. I mean, we're traveling right up the next 
three weeks. I'm I'm on the road the whole time, right up until the Christmas holidays, then back in New York with my family. So really looking forward to that. We thank you guys for joining us at No Tourists Allowed. Hope you had a good time. Be with us again next week and try to win that cruise, that Virgin Voyages cruise for two. Absolutely. Thanks. Goodbye. All right. Thanks, everyone.